Qatar LPO Infrastructure Summit 2016. If there is one thing that uh, we all Sri Lankans agree, irrespective of poli any political difference, is that our public transport system needs a serious overhaul, right? And we also uh, learned from the, uh, the speakers that, uh, uh, especially in Hong Kong, the ridership is very high, 90% in public transport. And Sri Lanka is fairly high when compared to other countries, but unfortunately it's going down. Now, this question is for Dorothy. Uh, I mean, how, can, how did Hong Kong get to this where, where you all are now? And that, so that we can take learnings from that. And then I will put question to the rest of the audience. Okay. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, actually, um, I must say that um, when I was working in the transport department in Hong Kong for the past 30 years, it was a struggle between the 1970s and the 1990s to do that. Um, up until 1998, uh, we always have a peak hour problem. People were queuing up, uh, complaints. But after 1998, the problem was gone. So when you do a survey among Hong Kong people before 1998, they said the top three problem, one of it is transport. After that, it is education and housing. So what I mean is that you, you need a master plan. And based on that master plan, there are some basic principles. I repeat the three principles, which I think work for every city. You have to continue to improve your rural infrastructure, your public transport capacity, but you need to encourage economic road users. That is, you have to give priority to those buses and trains that can move the largest number of people. Now, in Hong Kong, we use double-deckers. They are 140 passengers per bus. And our private car, on average, they carry two passengers. And three private cars okay. occupy the same road space as a double-decker. So we have not been very successful in providing elaborate bus rapid transit system, but we have bus-only lanes. But our, our urban center is very, is very congested. Uh, we don't have wide roads with dual four carriageway, dual five carriageway. We do three operation, but we managed. And the, the thing that to watch is that we have to make our public transport system affordable. If the fares are very high, people will evaluate the options, then they would not, they might may do other public transport services. They might not choose to do that. But then you ask me the question, then do you subsidize heavily? My answer is, we do not provide subsidy at all. They are operating on a self-finance basis, and they also compete. We have five franchise bus companies in Hong Kong, and they have to compete. But we provide the level playing field, but as officers in the transport department, we demand an annual route development plan so that we do not want wasteful and harmful competition but network. I think we repeatedly mentioned network. If you find that your journey is convenient, I can get out from home, I can get onto a minibus, and that minibus took me to the railway station. I don't need my car, and from the railway, it's three minutes per station in the Hong Kong case. So if you travel five stations, it's 15 minutes, you will be on spot on your destination. So that's how we operate. But we do have a peak hour problem now with our railway. It's always very costly to try to cater for the peak of the peak 15 minutes. So I heard talking about flexi time, you know, how we can spread the travel. But we do make some mistake when we talk about flexi time. We said if you travel on our railway between 7.45 and 8.15, you have to pay a higher fare. So everybody scream that you, you are punishing us, you raise the fares. So we said that now we have to do it on the reverse. That means if you do not travel during that period, we give you a discount. It's actually the same thing, but it's the way that you expressed. And you do have a lot of public comments and criticisms, but don't be offensive. They are for good intention. And if you listen, you start planning and work hand in hand. And if the community is convinced, like what we do, that public transport should receive priority, then it's already you know, a good job done. And that's why I mentioned white paper. Before we have a white paper, before we sort of have this uh, megapolis plan for the Western Colombo region, we, we present the plan, we do a green paper, and we ask everybody, including academics, professionals, politicians, the community, the users, is that what you think should help Hong Kong moving? And they don't disagree. They said, we understand, we have to do it. But you better do it fast. 
and you better do it logically so that you, you know, during the process of change, you reduce the pain. It's actually painful. Every new scheme we introduce for the first two weeks, a lot of complaints, fine tuning and adjustment, and we have to overcome that. So we have advisory committees, we have district advisory committees, and we bring them together. So maybe I can okay. stop here, Gaini. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. I think, Professor Kumarge, you're a strong advocate of public transport. Now, you also mentioned that the, the public transport utilization is coming down. Would you like to comment on that? Well, the, um, no, the public transport... Sorry, trans Dorothy, I think this question oh, sorry. is for Professor Kumarge. I'd like to comment on my own comment. Uh, no, in general. Uh, okay. In general. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the challenge for public transport has been there in every country, and I think uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, way back in the 70s, uh, decided to go uh, almost in an opposite direction to what other uh, East Asian countries did. And I think it has been proven that they chose the right way. Others have uh, uh, very expensive uh, elevated expressways and so on, uh, e even metro systems that are actually not pulling their weight and they are turning around now. So I think um, paradigm changes uh, are what actually uh, uh, makes uh, public transport successful. We've seen that around the world. London did it, and I was talking to Ajay, and I think many cities in the US are doing it now. Uh, then then uh, South America, we have so many uh, uh, good examples coming from the last two decades. So I think, uh, you know, Colombo needs to discover its own uh, unique blend of what we need to do for public transport. And there is a comment there, I might as well talk, take that up, which says, why am I advocating buses over LRT? Now, I'm not putting down LRT. What I'm saying is we have nearly 50% of the people on buses right now. We need a solution in two to three years. We need to manage the road space to accommodate the new economic activity that Colombo and the environments. And the best way to get that is actually to revitalize the buses. That is, the network is there, and that will take. And then the demand management, like even tolling and things like that, or what other, whatever other measures we have for traffic restraint, can be put in there. LRT is good, and we will need that kind of mass rapid transit definitely over the next 10, maybe 20 years. There's no question about that. It is when, and it is where. That's the only thing. Front end in that, I think we are putting a lot of money into something that will take a lot of time to deliver, and it will deliver at enormous cost to a very small fraction of the ridership. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of prioritizing, and I think to get out of this situation very quickly, uh, see our bus system, whatever we uh, talk about it in terms of its negatives, uh, it's, uh, it's a half a billion dollar industry, and uh, it doesn't receive any subsidy, okay? It's affordable to people, and it works. Okay, it may be not what the car user likes, or even the bus user likes, but it is there to improve. So I think that building block needs to be taken up and done. Okay, so Dimanda, now um, we have a grand plan as part of Megapolis, right? We must think big, right? But we need to have quick wins, we have to move fast. Now, especially in terms of, because as part of your Megapolis plan, you have a bus improvement plan as well. So could you please elaborate on the journey because it's a journey, it's a long journey. We have to think long term, like Ajay mentioned. You know, okay, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, so I, I totally agree that we need to, and our plan has the improvements on the buses. It's about how we do it, and do we do it for the whole bus systems, or do we, uh, do we find uh, separate corridors to improve? And what is the capacity that we are going to increase by doing it? And do we have space to do it, right? So definitely the bus passengers are vital because b b the railway, we need to connect all these mass transport with buses. Definitely we have to do that. But the key is uh, the bus passengers has to, like the, we, the passengers, uh, we, along the corridors, they should be in shorter, uh, shorter distances, stops, so that people can be uh, accommodated and get into the buses and get to the race stations. So the plan looks at uh, the remodernization of the total buses, and I think uh, you know the it it 
it will need subsidy. The buses will need subsidy, and there in, in certain uh, certain rate there is a subsidy with the tax concessions that's given for importation of buses and so on. And uh, uh, so the same policies has to be uh, updated, but then uh, used, and then uh, the. You know, we have to upgrade the total experience of buses. If you look at the buses right now, um, you take the you know the Tata or the uh, the Leyland buses that's there. Those are not passenger buses. Those are all uh, like you know we call it lorry chassis with you know lo uh, with. You know, it's not sub, it is not for the passenger movement. And you, you, if you have used a bus uh, with, uh, with, uh, that's going on the expressway and that is on the, on the public bus system on lo local roads, you would see how different the feeling is. Right? So that's why we have to upgrade it, get to, to a situation where we, the people have the quality of uh, transportation through buses to get there. So that is something that we are going to work on and we have already started uh, negotiation with the uh, talks with the Western Province Transport Authority, uh, CTB, NTC to use the bus system, expand the bus system, and use the expressways to have a better mobility with with the centres uh, and also to go to this bus modernisation with incorporating the existing bus users. We have to think about the, uh, and I think uh, what Professor Kumarge uh, mentioned was about the Sahasara. And it is a great concept. And this, I think this is uh, Sahasara, uh, even it is said as a uh, prepaid car system, it is another way of restructuring the buses. And uh, this has been tried in the Western region for so long. And uh, it is another way of doing the restructuring, creating cluster companies. So uh, I think we have to use it. And that is what the uh, Western Province Transport Authority is going to look at. And these are the ideas that we want to incorporate. And we want to get the line agencies to look into this. And this is definitely a, a short-term uh, solution that we are looking into. OK. I think Ruan and I, Ito was yeah. very quiet, so I'll oh. put this question to Ruan now. Um, uh, Sri Lanka aspires to become a logistics hub. Now, with megapolis and port city kicking in, how will that going to help and you know add to the congestion as well? So, as from the industry, how do you think that you need this new plan should kick off so that it'll help the industry as well? Yeah, we. Uh, with the government's aspiration of becoming a dynamic uh, logistics hub, uh, um, I think I fully agree with something that Dr. Kumarage said. It's about uh, how, sh uh, how it should be output driven. Um, it's uh, not about having a great port or an airport. Uh, making Sri Lanka a logistics hub, it's all about connectivity. Uh, you need to be able to connect these ports and airports. I notice in the Megapolis uh, plan there are the cargo corridors and uh, logistics centers and all that uh, uh, been drawn out. Um, now, uh, when you talk of connectivity, uh, uh, there's one positive thing that has happened during the last uh, uh, two or three years. That's the setting up of uh, free zones in the country. We have our inherent limitations. Uh, we are a small country, a small um, domestic market. Um, uh, we don't have large manufacturers here. So you need to attract cargoes from various uh, countries into uh, Sri Lanka to value add. Um, so you need to be uh, able to connect goods um, uh, between uh, airports and ports. Uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, freight movements become very important. Um, it, one thing is about sustainability, something that we always talk about, uh, the quality of uh, the hardware, the, the, the trucks and all that type of thing. Uh, we have very poor quality trucks and much to be desired. Um, so that adds on to cost. Okay. Um, and uh, being in the private sector, running a large logistics company, uh, what our customers want is 
speed to market. It's always speed to market. If someone is delivering within five days, uh, they want to make it two days. Uh, if they are delivering in two weeks, they want to make it one week. So we are challenged to, to deliver to market as, uh, within the shortest possible time. So we have to have these transport corridors. Uh, it's all about speed. It's all about uh, cost. Uh, so we have to have these designated transport uh, corridors to, to ensure that we achieve speed. And we need to have the, have, um, um, uh, the connectivity in terms of technology. Uh, be one thing that we are advocating is uh, to have an integrated IT community system a single window system to integrate all stakeholders. Here we see people running between ports, airports, authorities. I mean, that's all, that all adds to cost. You need to minimize human intervention. Um, just to move a shipment, how many times we would have to run to customs or whatever authority that uh, it involves uh, is huge, and that adds on to cost. And uh, we're not the cheapest in terms of uh, transactions. Uh, so it is important to, uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, technology integration is also important, which will help, help congestion. Uh, so these are some of the things uh, that uh, we need to look at. Then uh, more futuristic uh, is, uh, are things like uh, e-commerce coming into play. Uh, it happens big time in the West. Uh, it's uh, bursting at its seams in India and uh, China. Uh, so the parcel sizes are getting smaller. Uh, there are more deliveries and it'll, it'll, the parcel sizes will only get smaller. So you will have more movements. Uh, uh, so we need to be ready to cater for that. Um, so these are some of the new things and some of the destructions that uh, you might have to take into consideration are these concepts like Uber, uh, which, which, uh, which I, I, I don't in any way think that these are uh, substitutes, but uh, these will destruct to some, some extent. Um, and perhaps Uberization of uh, cargo movements might happen. So these are some, uh, some very new destruction that will kind of perhaps change the dynamics. Okay, so coming back to Dimanta once again, now in, in, as part of your megapolis plan, you also talk about to improve sustainability and also to decongestion uh, to, uh, in the, in the, on the roads. You also talk about uh, certain flexiars and all that, which will certainly help the, the industry to, to decongest the roads. So would you like to uh, talk a bit about that as to how this will really help and then what would be the reaction from the private sector? or the government sector for that matter, uh, you know, in implementing such measures and practicality of that as well. Yeah, Dimanta, over to you. Yeah, the, the flexi hours, uh, the suggestion has been there. It's not a new concept. Uh, you know, the flexi hour, uh, you know, there have been kind of reports written about it, studies about it, and it is about the implementation. So in our case, it is, we, we have to go from the, like, you know, studies to the implementation. And that is what we have done. And if, you, if I can uh, elaborate on what's flexi hours, uh, f uh, we can uh, flexi hours or flexible work times can be up based on four areas. One is you have a fixed time of core time that workers would come to, should be there at work. And then you have a flexible time. Someone can start at 10 o'clock, finish at 6 o'clock, or someone can start at 7 o'clock and finish at 3 o'clock. So given the same eight hour of uh, time frame. But what that allows is we, we are going to dampen the uh, peak period right now. The peak period, uh, then we, we can, uh, it's spread. We call it peak sp spreading. So when peak spreading happens, it actually allows to like marginally in decrease the demand uh, for, for the peak times. And also it allows, now you, you can see the, uh, the buses are competing for this peak time. And that would allow to rescheduling 
so that the peak time is given for the buses as well. And the second, second concept is then you can have a, a compressed week, where uh, compressed week is uh, instead of five working days, um, you know, you can have 10 hour, sh 10, 10 hour working hours for four days. That is another concept. Another concept is work from home. And then another concept is uh, part-time work or shift work. So this, but what we want to start with with the mega policy, starting with the flexi hours, flexible work times, and then we have engaged with the Chamber of Commerce, and and we have a very positive uh, response from the chamber, saying that you know certain uh, private companies already implement it, and mind you, you, we can't do it for all the sectors. It it has to be selected based on certain management levels, certain uh, industries, so. Uh, and the government sector also should be participating in it. So that will be a short-term solution for that. Okay, the one thing that really caught my attention, Ajay, uh, what you specifically talk about this, spoke about the seamless connectivity to get a pleasurable experience, because mobility is something that we need to really look at. So how do you really, because how do you really um, uh, do that? You know, because you have to, you know, think of the customer, customer is, in, King and you know whatever that really uh, make him or her really happy is going to what really you know, win at the end of the day. Like, uh, first and foremost, I didn't say customers king. I've got two ladies here, yes. three ladies, customers queen. Okay, so I stand politically correct. More importantly, seamless. You cannot change the modes. Mode will stay as it is. And Hong Kong's got the octopus card. We have the metro card. So we've got different modes, except the experience of the customer, which is the riding public here. That should be seamless. How does it do it? By smart ticketing. So you have one ticketing system across different modes. And at the end of the day, there is a central bank which basically divides up what, depending upon what rides you've had, and the money goes to the different agencies. That is the only way you do it. But you know, luckily, uh, and I say, I'm not putting anyone down here, but you are starting from scratch. This is what's happening in the past here. You've got to also link it to heavy rail. Because, you know, Sri Lanka, heavy rail has to be utilized. I looked at uh, electrification, distances. You've, you know, you've got a compact country. And you, what you need to do is redensify your CBDs. Think into account what's happening with technology where people are going to be working more from home. That's reality. It's going to come. So take that into account. Take the smart ticketing to account. Make the seamless connectivity. So if I'm, you know, I'm living in Kandy, I come into the city only three days a week because that's all I needed. Everything else I can take care of sitting at home in Kandy because I have great internet connectivity. And I can have online uh, meetings, I can have all of that's happening. So three days a week, I don't need to come here and buy another ticket for the LRT system. My train system should be able to give me a ticket included with whatever rides I need in the LRT system. That's the seamless connectivity I'm talking about. Uh, one more thing I want to address because I'm hearing it a lot about uh, the quality of buses. And you're absolutely right, the quality of buses need to be improved. They are not buses, they are truck chassis where a bus body has been built on it. When the LRT system is going to come, the experience of the commuter on the LRT is going to be so good that he and she or she is going to demand the same service on the buses. So while we are planning to the LRT system, we need to start planning on the bus systems also. The bus, at the end of the day, all systems will be dependent upon each other. So if I have a LRT and I'm going to move 800 people every two minutes, I need buses to feed into my system. I need buses to take people out from the system. Over time, one of the things that, you know, we have such huge ridership in New York City Transit is that for two hours, if you take a bus, you buy one ticket, a metro card ticket on a bus system, for the next two hours, you've got free interchange from the bus system onto the train system, on the uh, metro system or the LRT system and vice versa. So both systems will be feeding off each other. At the end of the day, we've got to focus on one thing itself. It's the experience of the customer. How do we make the customer happy? Right now, we are looking at numbers of 50% uh, mass transit. But 50%, I think, mostly are buses. 
we've got a rail system that is totally underutilized. A rail system that was, going back to your numbers, 1952, it was one of the best systems that we had. We've got to bring that to a state of good repair. We've got to get our buses to a state of good repair. We're going to have a brand new LRT system. A brand new LRT system with a state of good repair for these two systems, you know, this is going to be heaven. And at the end of the day, the more choices is going to be done by the people who are going to write the system. If we give them the right solutions, they will not use the car. Staying one more minute on this. Uh, Bloomberg, who was the mayor for New York, worth at least 10, 15 billion dollars. He had his own retinue of, you know, these black heavy duty Chevy Armada cars. Never used it. You, you could see him on the morning one and nine going from his house into his office on city, New York City. Every morning you saw him in the morning and the evening. He took mass transit because it made sense. At the end of the day for any business person, time is money. If I'm going to waste 20 minutes sitting there and doing nothing, I'm going to use mass transit and move forward. Yeah, thank you, Ajay. Amelie, would you like to? Yeah. I like to, there were several questions uh, aiming at RDA. I like to pick only one question, uh, considering the time. Uh, there was a question that why RDA is abiding with their existing plans and why can't we uh, work together with other plans uh, as a one uh, abide into one plan. So I must say that as planners, we are very uh, like to do some kind of uh, that plan abide to work together with all other ministries and have a one plan for the benefit of the country. But problem is our government system or ministerial setup fragmented to pieces, uh, especially transport and highways are two ministries. So it is very difficult for us to come into one uh, plan, agree into one plan at many occasions. I think this is a matter of urgency to discuss with the government uh, when they are dividing or allocating ministries. Uh, we have to think about the functionalities of those ministries. Now it is a very difficult task for us to handle transport related issues as highways is uh, coming under some other ministry. So, uh, sorry, uh, I am not in a position to promise you that RDA can abide with the total plan under these circumstances. Thank you, Namali. I think uh, I would now pose this question to Ito because he's been very quiet for some time. Uh, Hitachi is known to be uh, last conference also representative was there from yeah. Hitachi known for monorail yeah. but I think uh, do you think uh, Hitachi uh, can provide the solution that the megapolis transportation plan is offering yeah thank you for the opportunity uh, or they uh, well there, there are some questions raised from the audience as well about the uh, our proposal for monorail and now um, uh, how, how it ha what happened to be uh, the plan for LRT. And then I would like to uh, explain a little bit about the background. As uh, Mr. Uh, Ajayasin rightly mentioned, uh, it is quite right to, uh, well, it, it is uh, not correct to underestimate mm -hmm. the uh, traffic demand. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be miserable at the end of the day. So that, um, uh, the plan has been changed from serving single corridor from central uh, Colombo to uh, Malabe from, uh, to the um, extensive uh, network of 75 kilometers of LRT. Then in that sense, uh, uh, the megapolis planning team um, has increased the uh, estimate uh, demand from the JICA study of about the 20,000 to 30,000 uh, PPHPD passenger per hour per direction, which means the system has to be bigger. However, uh, the uh, uh, monorail system is very good in terms of uh, carrying a big capacity. Uh, with a minimum investment, 
but uh, within this uh, 75 uh, kilometers of total uh, system, uh, it's a mixture of the on-ground system and elevated system. And the that planning team uh, uh, desire to have a single technology to serve the uh, this entire uh, network, which means uh, monorail cannot serve the uh, on-ground uh, corridors. It has no meaning. Then the, it has to be the steel wheel technology. And um, 33rd, on the other hand, is good enough to be the uh, full-scale MRTS, as Mr. Jason rightly mentioned. However, uh, the land uh, required, I mean, the, for the MRTS is huge. Then there is, there is a limitation of land in the uh, very narrow space in the center of Colombo that the system has to go through, maneuver through very narrow corridor that this is the uh, benefit, advantage of LRT system. So combine all these together, uh, LRT will be the best solution. And Hitachi is one of the, or is the only company, uh, at least in Japan, who has the capability to deliver uh, European-based system and also Japanese-based system. Because Hitachi has acquired uh, major two European companies these days. Uh, last year we uh, well, announced the full acquisition of a company uh, now called Hitachi Rail Italy. Okay. Answer the Breda, yeah. uh, historically. Yeah. Thank you, too. I think yeah. we haven't finalized the, uh, the right. awarding of the contract. Yeah. So, that's the yeah. basement, uh, that's the background we are able to deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Dimanta, uh, there is an audience question. Do we have a 20-year rolling plan revised every five years as uh, Ajay suggested as part of the Met Megapolis plan? Uh, Would you like to comment on that? Which question is the five-year Yeah, supplement. rolling basis like what Ajay suggested. Yeah, I think, no, we, we, we have the, the master plan. The master plans gets, get, needs to be revised as it goes along, right, yes. as it goes along. So master plan, uh, we don't have right now a five-year plan after five plan so we that is part what is the master plans are master plan is go for long long term uh, yeah planning but then this has to be, has, uh, to be has to be revised as it goes yeah. okay. and i want to touch base on one thing if yeah. i can get one minute on i think uh, uh, mrs simala pitya talked about you know the roads and how rda can is why you are not planning together i think we have been uh, the this planning process of the, the megapolis plan has been a collaborative effort with all the ministry ministries so we the six months period we have been meeting every month every every week uh, including uh, the the core team of uh, transportation engineers with the cmc rda minister of transport ntc western province transport authority 30 stakeho stakeholders like you know to get their inputs what their current plans are and so we have taken what the rda plans were and ongoing projects were and then revised some of them for example there was elevated road along the baseline road so that is not in our plan so we because we want to prioritize to have it on for the lrt system so similarly uh, so basically we have taken the line agencies plans into consideration when we have developed the plans the second one i want to show is the um, uh, Working. I saw a question about why, why do we want to enforce, what, is the government trying to enforce the working times now? No. It is about choices. Like, you know, people should be given choices. And uh, again, here it's a choice. It's, uh, it's not enforcing that you work 10 hour shifts or it is uh, you are working, you should work on these flexible hours. It's a choice that a person can take. And if you can take, there are a majority of people who would want to come, I, I, know, I, I want to touch this if I can get time on the school services, yeah. well, right? Quick, quick one, because yeah. I have another question yes. before So, uh, because one I have minute, seen yeah. where the people loitering around the schools, where people drop peer students to school and just don't go to work just because the work time works doesn't start until 8.30, right? So these kind of people can actually go start their work early and leave early. So th these are the options people sh should have and for the people to make the choice rather than enforcement. Yeah. I think public perceive, normally this question is for you, public perceive that highways are meant to be, not meant to be for uh, public transport, you know? So how can you really make use because existing infrastructure is available now? 
you know, to ease off the traffic congestion, how can we use that and maybe make buses suitable to drive on those? Actually, uh, I have to accept the fact that most of our new rehabilitation have not looked into this. But uh, I, as I said you, uh, next master plan will address this issue seriously and we are trying our level best to accommodate uh, public transport facilities and as well as road safety into uh, road rehabilitation programs when they are uh, doing capacity increments or widening such cases. Uh, as uh, Dr. Dimanta mentions, we are also there are plans to include uh, public transport facilitation uh, at least at uh, intersections in the new uh, expressway network to come. We have lost not many chances in previously developed express a network although we uh, earlier we have calculated all development benefits and regional benefits facilitating this and that in the, during the uh, formulation stage during the construction due to so many other reasons beyond our control has uh, restricted us of doing so as an example none of these existing expressways interchanges doesn't have bus terminals uh, they are not facilitating bus movements. So, uh, seriously, this uh, will be looked after in next uh, few expressways in line. Thank okay. you. I think in the interest of time, I think we need to stop now. Thank you very much, all of you, for, for, the, uh, for, for being a very wonderful panel. But unfortunately, there were lots of questions. We were not able to answer all of it. Uh, uh, I mean, public transport is a priority. We all know that. And uh, Megapolis has grand plans. I think our responsibility is uh, we need to support this initiative. It is long term, but we need to have quick wins so that we get confidence that this plan will be a reality. So strategy has to be executed. It's not going to be a bed of roses. And we need to have confidence and have some patience to make it happen. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. LBR LBO Infrastructure Summit 2016